Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Suzanne Leal, and I'm the host of Thursday Book Club. For those of you who are new, we meet weekly at 8 p.m. on Thursdays on Zoom. Once a month, and sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less, we have a guest author. To be part of Thursday Book Club, please just go to my website to subscribe and um, you'll get a newsletter which will give you the link to get in and join us. Tonight I'm coming to you from Gadigal land of the Eora Nation and I pay my respects to elders past and present. And I'm super delighted to have Dr Lee Kaufman as my guest this week. Lee's work has been shortlisted for the Mark and Yvette Moran Nib Literary Award and longlisted for the Abbey Awards. Her latest book is this one, which any of you writers out there will know, is The Writer Laid Bare. It's, um, yeah, it's a writing handbook, but it's more than that. It's a memoir, it's a contemplation, it's a guide, it's a place for writers to find solace and understanding. It's... um. It's a terrific read. Uh, congratulations, Lee, and welcome to you. Oh, thank you so much. It's so beautiful to be talking to you again, Suzanne. This is not our first time. <laughs> this is not. This is not. No, it's um. So it, it it's lovely how Zoom can can bring everyone closer because, of course, you're coming from Melbourne, are you not? Yep. Excellent. Um, Lee, just to to give a bit of context to everyone here today, you were born in Russia. You moved to Israel where you worked as a journalist and you published your first books in Hebrew. And then at the age of 26, with almost no English, you come to Australia. Why? <laughs> well, I thought it would be my sort of stop over on the way to Europe because uh, I had this dream always to go and see all the sort of uh, places where great, because I really love European writers, so I thought I'll go and see, you know, all the places where Fitzgerald maybe sat in Paris, um, uh, yeah, in Paris with Hemingway and go to London and, you know, explore Europe a bit. But I had family in Sydney who I didn't know very well. So I thought I'll come to Australia. Hey, Lee, if you can hear me, I think we've just lost you because you've just frozen. Um, I'm wondering whether... But Australia was wonderful and I met my first husband here. Did I freeze? Yeah, you froze. I'm not sure. But did, did it freeze for everybody else as well? Just give me a nod. Yeah, yeah. So, so maybe that that is... Maybe that I, is think, I think it's better now. Uh, is it okay? I just checked my... Yeah, okay. Sorry yeah. about it. Hope it's done for us is that we can just run with it, can't we? People will freeze a bit, doesn't matter, we keep on going. If it happens again, I can just change my internet provider quite quickly. Okay, so so what um what I got to was the beginning of an answer as to why you came to Australia. Me, me it was to be a stopover on the way to Europe because Europe was where you wanted to be. But yes. And I had my family here in Sydney that, and I thought I'll just live with them a little bit, uh, do some cash in, um, you know, cash in hand sort of work, save a bit of money and live. But of course, I fell in love with Australia, especially with Melbourne. And then I also fell in love with a man and married him and stayed and got divorced and married another Australian man and get divorced. Married another Australian man. And here I am here with Australian children 24 years later. And can I say, if that has um, piqued your interest, um, Lee's um, marriages to men in Australia, then you can get everything in an earlier memoir called The Dangerous Bride, which um fascinating. I think that was my first introduction to Lee. I hadn't, I hadn't, I think I'd heard you being interviewed on radio about the dangerous bride. I thought, my God, she's wild. <laughs> and then when I, be boring now. <laughs> then when I met, met you, I thought, oh, I'm gonna be so tame. I'm gonna be, I felt like the daggy kid at school meeting the good, the cool kid. <laughs> anyway, recommendation for the dangerous bride. Thank you. <laughs> you come to Australia, you marry. You marry someone in Australia, your first husband. Uh, how did you learn English? How did you go about that? I actually, um, look, I've, so if I, I wrote my first, uh, sorry, my third book in Hebrew from Australia. 
and then I realized it was really I can't be a writer you know living in Australia writing in another language I'll be so lonely because you know I'm what is called literary writer which means I don't make much money from my writing <laughs> so I have to at least have some readers and audiences and and writer friends otherwise what's the point of doing all that so I actually sort of took it as a project to learn English and I deliberately these days I'm not sure I made the right choice but at the time I just deliberately decided to stop reading and writing in Russian and Hebrew so I completely kind of disengaged from those two languages and completely focused on writing on reading English and writing straight in English and I would just I remember in my first years in Australia I would just sit with lots of dictionaries around me including dictionaries of idioms because there are so many idioms I could not get my head around and I would painstakingly read books in English and every word I didn't know which was every second word at the start I would underline and write in Hebrew the translation above it and I, I yeah and I must say finally embarrassingly I actually enjoyed it because I'm I am a real nerd I can be wild but I'm also very nerdy <laughs> so after a few years I kind of started and because I was um my second husband was uh um English uh, my first husband was we spoke Hebrew at home but even though he lived here but um uh, my second husband we spoke English at home so I kind of and most of my friends were uh, Australian so once I started sort of having this also internal um, dialogue in my head in English, I knew I can I can write, you know, not not very well, but at least I can do my draft straight in English on the paper. The ambition to to learn a language so that you can become the literary writer you are in a foreign in in, in your your basically mother tongue um, seems an extraordinary task. I mean, my French is I think very good. I mean, it's fluent. Uh, but the thought of writing in Fran French completely makes me balk because I think, well, where is the voice? What sort of voice have I got apart from the voice of a slightly um, clumsy foreigner? D did that ever occur to you or did you wait until your English was to the level you needed it before you started to write? It's such a great question, Susan. Can I just say, I really think you're underselling yourself because uh you French is really good but you haven't actually lived in I mean I know you lived for some chunks of time but you never migrated to France I think if you would ever one day move to France and live there you'll just feel differently about uh, your confidence in uh, ability to write in this language because you'll be swimming in it you know it's like you're not going to be a guest there you're going to be sort of like in the language but um look I think I, I had this sort of stupid bravery at the time. I mean, everybody told me I can't do it. Mm -hmm. And I'm a rebel, but I'm a naturally born rebel. <laughs> so as soon as somebody says to me, I can't do something, I can't get divorced and married, I can't, you know, I, I can't uh, move countries, I can't write in English, I, don't know, I have to do it then. It's, it's very easy. It's very easy. That's how I wrote most of my books. For Every time I wrote a book, especially The Dangerous Bride, somebody told me I can't do it for whatever ethical or whatever reason. So anyway, so so that I think my, my kind of confidence, came, not confidence, but just sort of stupid bravery kind of came from, from that. It was a challenge. But also, you know, my first three books, as you said, were written in Hebrew and Hebrew is not my mother uh, tongue either I was born in Russia so I feel like I kind of look it of course it's, it was different with Hebrew because I came to Israel when I was 12 years old it's much easier to learn the language but I think I just had this kind of feeling that well I've done it once maybe I could do this again I in in Israel I started writing in Hebrew after being also um, maybe just three years in the country, I became a journalist quite young. There was a particular program, a national program there for young journalists. And yeah, I just thought, well, I'll try and repeat the same thing. It's interesting when you said, um, you know, I, I'd done it once, so it made it easier for me to have the confidence to do it again. A similar thing that I've been feeling lately is when you write a book, even though you're starting from scratch it's a new book um and I don't necessarily think it helps to have written a different book because you need to do the new one but what's giving me um solace I suppose at the moment is that I know that I've written a messy book before and the messy book got better so yeah. if I'm writing mm -hmm. a messy book now 
that's okay because I have the, you know, I have a couple of examples now of a messy, inadequate book that can actually be turned into something worthwhile. Is that is that a similar sort of feeling that you had um, in terms of that confidence of having been there once before to go again? It's interesting to hear this from you, Suzanne, because you, like me, you kind of, you sort of write between different genres. You 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 write for children, for young adults, sorry, not young adults, but yeah, children and, and for adults. Um, for me, for me, I think if I, whenever I'm venturing into a new genre, I um, I, f- I feel like I'm a complete beginner. I totally start from from the beginning, and it's not a wrong feeling. I really am making all the beginners' mistakes. So, for example, when having written three fiction books, uh, and two of them were novels, but one of them was collection of short stories. So again, a bit different genres. Uh, so having written three fiction books, uh, you would think, well, I can write a book. But no, when I started writing The Dangerous Bride, which was my first memoir, I've done everything wrong. <laughs> like like many first-time memoirists, I thought that um, if I only have for some reason one chance ever to write a memoir. So I was trying to write about everything. The topic was my two non-monogamous relationships. But instead of focusing on those relationships, I also wrote about my monogamous relationships. I also wrote about my parents, my childhood, the lives of my parents before I was even born. <laughs> All that stuff, but of course, I checked out later, and I wrote another memoir later. But um, but I think I think for me, really, it's a matter of yeah, of genre. So my second and third creative nonfiction works, you know, I, I found it still difficult, but not as challenging to write as the Dangerous Bride. But now I'm thinking about going back to fiction after having not written fiction for a very, very long time. Uh, and I'm totally scared and terrified and I don't feel like I've done it once, I'll do it again. I more feel like um, I'm going to, uh, It's I'll probably fail, but I may as well just try. So then I don't have regrets and I'll know I tried. So it, it is a very sort of strong sense of failure. So I don't know, I, it doesn't always get easier for me. <laughs> What brings me to to another question I had, which is, uh, it was interesting for me that you your books in Hebrew are fiction, and to date, all your books in English are non-fiction. Is that something to do with your age or your um, language? What 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 why why? <laughs> why a- language and non-fiction in in, in English. Uh, that's a really good question to see. That's why I love talking to you. You always ask me good questions. <laughs> I, hope, I hope one day I'll be sitting and interviewing you. <laughs> um, that's my dream. Uh, but anyway, actually, I did once. Remember on that panel when there were yes. you were one of the three panelists. I would like to do it one on one. Anyway, that's that's a wish. I might hold you to that, Lee, and watch this space. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah. But but back to the question of fiction, it's it's I like I really like this question. So my first three books were fiction because I had no idea there was anything else I could write. In creative nonfiction is a kind of newish sort of genre, especially in in countries that are not America. It sort of again impetus in America and then spread slowly into other countries. So when I was starting out as a writer, I started writing really early, too early. That's why my First book was terrible because I published it when I was 20. So I'm talking about early 90s. Uh, in Israel, we just didn't have, nobody was writing memoirs. People would maybe write traditional autobiography if they were famous, but nobody would sort of write creative, you know, nonfiction kind of novel like memoir. Um, but when I'm looking back to those three books that I wrote, they deeply autobiographical. I think I'm one of those so-called confessional writers not in the sense that I like confessing in a kind of outrageous you know gossipy way but just in the sense that I'm I'm a kind of writer that really draws from life not not just my own but also of people around me who I'm interested in but they ha- it has to be it has to have some roots in reality and so even my second book in Hebrew which was a collection of short stories mostly told in first person male perspective. Mm -hmm. Uh, Even though that book was extremely autobiographical because every one of my male narrators held some of my anxieties and flaws. One of them, for example, was a young journalist who came from an uneducated sort of neighbor, um, a small town and 
tried to make this ambition to make it and become this intellectual in Tel Aviv, but he always had chip on his shoulder. He always felt not educated enough, always was looked down for, by other people, or like his colleagues. And I, at the time, was exactly in the same position. I was from Ashdod, which is a kind of uh, very small town, mostly uh, not very small, but mostly known for its criminals and and. Uh, um, beauty queens uh, <laughs> so I came to Tel Aviv was trying to make my life as a you know my career as a writer nobody was looking at me I was not intellectual enough I didn't have the right accent not Russian accent I just had Ashdod accent you know like a very sort of um, you could say Bogan accent if you think about it in Australian context yeah so so really all my books were very autobiographical and when I came to Australia um, I remember it distinctly when I, I was uh um, maybe I was in my early 30s and I saw this advertisement in Writers Victoria where I, luckily I was a member then. I, I don't know what I did would have done if my life I didn't see that ad. It was an ad by Griffith from the journal Griffith Review, the literary journal, which is so such a good journal. I had no idea it was a good journal. I was new to Australia. That's why I, I didn't think... It, and uh, that's why I sort of dared looking at the advertisement and the advertisement said... They interested in a personal essay about uh, some topic that I felt connection to. It was about personal networks. And I thought, well, I'm a migrant. I know all about how important personal networks are. And I thought, personal essay, what is this thing? So I looked it up and I thought, I want to have a go with this. And I started writing it because, again, I didn't know that Griffith Review was a good journal. I thought it would be just some local magazine. And I started writing that essay and I just felt so liberated suddenly because unlike unlike in writing fiction, I didn't have to bring all this machinery of scenes and characters and place and dialogue to say what I wanted to say directly. But if I wanted to be creative and uh, do a bit of dialogue, a bit of sort of descriptive detail, I could, but I didn't have to. So I could sort of, I really love the fact that in that essay, I put, I put a bit of, I made a few creative scenes. I used some philosophy, I used some statistics, whatever I felt like, and it just worked for me. So from that essay onwards, I just um, went into uh, writing creative nonfiction for a long time and editing two anthologies of uh, memoir as well. But now... I'm starting to get interested again in fiction and I can feel myself also being drawn to fiction more as a reader at the moment. Mm -hmm. I haven't read fiction with pleasure for a long time and now I do it again. It's interesting. I um, What was interesting about um, the, um, the, the, the memoir question and the Griffith Review is um, the end of the story. What happened with the Griffith Review? Was it accepted? It was, yeah, and it became my first sort of serious publication in Australia. Yes, it was called uh, "Discovering My Mother Tongue," and it was a, it was really a story of how I uh, was all was always in Israel, a bit uncomfortable about my Russian origins, a bit in denial, trying to blend in like a good migrant, and I sort of could because. When you come young to a country, it's much easier to learn the accent, to learn to speak like a local. But in Australia, I just literally could not as much as I wanted to blend in. You know, I'm still, I'm, I've been here for 24 years and I can't, and my accent is so strong. So I, I kind of sort of gravitated towards Russian migrants in Melbourne. And and for a while, just for my first year or so, they pretty much adopted me and I found kind of a bit of a community there and it, it was very soothing to sort of settling in. Uh, so so here I was I came to to Australia from Israel, but found myself working in a <laughs> job. Yeah, so that was the essay. Wow. And um, how long had you been in Australia by that stage? When it was published, um, I was four years. Six years. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm going to move on. We've got some writers um, in our audience tonight, but also um, in our audience on YouTube. And what I want to know about, first of all, is why you wrote this book, The Writer Laid Bare. What was the, what was the inspiration or the impetus behind it? Is it going to show I've been, <laughs> thank you. I've been uh, blogging about the creative writing process for a long time. Uh, in fact, Suzanne, you were one of my guest bloggers uh, a couple of years ago, I think, which was lovely. Um, and the reason I was uh, blogging about writing, I started blogging about it since 2013. No, even earlier. 
Uh, sorry, no, anyway, mid mid 2000s. Uh, but um, the reason I started blogging about it is because I suffered for four years from a writer's block. And I found that blogging about creative writing process was one of the things that helped me to connect again to my sort of writing flow, whatever, I don't know what words to sort of put onto this. Um, and a, a few years ago, my public, so this blog has been going for a long time and it's been quite successful. And uh, in terms of like, you know, drawing a lot of traffic and I also used to be I, I did for a few years I was a guest blogger about the same thing for writers Victoria um and I'm a teacher of writing so you know I'm, I mean I'm interested in, in in the writing process both as somebody who used to be blocked so severely and as a creative writer and also as a teacher you know um and then my publisher uh from Ventura Press Jane Curry came a few years ago to me and said why well, won't you do a book based on your blog and initially I thought well yeah, how easy. I'll just take my posts, put them together, and I've got a book. I don't need to go out on a book again. <laughs> so for about five minutes, I just had this elation. And then I went to look at my blog and I realized what a what a dumb, dumb thought it was, because my blog is a real eclectic sort of mixture of, you know, sort of reflective posts and humorous posts and music, whatever. It's not, it's not really kind of a um proper you know it's it's not like a very strong theme it's a pretty whimsical kind of blog but then I thought well I what if what if I wrote a book that maybe would have helped me a long time ago when I was blocked what if I sort of tried and sort of wrote I know it sounds a bit corny and I kind of cringe when I said but I was I did have this sort of thought in my head what if I kind of thought of myself when I was younger and blocked as my potential audience and I write this because I also thought how my my block was, I mean, it's, it, I could talk about this for hours, but just to say it as succinctly and what sort of as possible, my, my issues around writing when I was blocked were all to do with emotional honesty. I just was not honest on the page, not honest with myself um, about how I saw the words, you know, about what I wanted to write. It was all to do with that sort of stuff. I wasn't even honest with myself in terms of, the processes I needed in place to write well. Like I wouldn't even, I'll just give you one ridiculous example. Like it did not occur to me at the time, but to be a writer, you actually have to prioritize writing. <laughs> because I was so scared of writing, I could not admit it to myself that I actually need a routine because that would be setting myself up for failure in my head then. So I kind of tried to pretend that it was okay to write occasionally and I'll still, of course, come up with a book, which was bullshit. But I kept saying to myself, well, you've got, you wrote three books, you know, you can do another one in this sort of sporadic fashion, but it didn't work like this. Anyway, so I just thought, well, why wouldn't I write a writing book then? Why wouldn't I take some of my blog posts, but then create also new material and, and take it as a unifying theme, this idea of um, the concept of emotional honesty and how it can be useful to us writers in every aspect, really. I mean, for me, it, it's useful in every aspect in terms of uh, how I, how I, um organize my writing process you know make it sustainable um how i process the word and then you know present it on the page and even i think uh, it's the concept of emotional honesty can be really important to writers in their private lives so to try and kind of, because writing is such a as you know suzanne very well and everybody else who is listening with writers we know we're not we don't sort of close shop at five o'clock and go and relax in front of TV. I mean, we pretend that we relax in front of TV, but, you know, the head is always working. So I just thought that to live a good, fulfilling life, for me at least, I have to be constantly honest with myself about what my priorities are, how much do I want to sacrifice for writing in terms of my private life and how much I don't, you know, all that sort of stuff. And just briefly, what was the answer? How much were you prepared to sacrifice? Well, you know what? It, it it really changes. I now, but I'm I'm thinking back to my, my life. There's so many things I've done. I've done. You know, I, I, there's so many things I sacrificed for writing. I shouldn't have. Like I remember rushing my second wedding, <laughs> and not even going on the proper honeymoon because I was so obsessed with getting my book together. And I would never do this th these days. I had my first child when I was almost forty. So actually. Um, risk my uh, not I mean I, I took the risk of not, never having children because your fertility is so you know so much lower at this age but I kind of was so worried about not being able to write when I have children so I waited and waited but 
then I found out that actually after I had children, um, I became a much more organized and prolific writer than before. And that taught me a lot too about how to prioritize. So it's not like I have all the answers, but today I actually, I kind of found out what works for me at least and was sustainable for me is to write steadily, but a little bit every day. So I write much better if I write even just like one hour, four or five times a week, um, and then do my other, live my other life. Uh, then if I, and, and I actually can be more productive like this than if I sort of take chunks of my life and totally get obsessed with the writing and forget everything else, because then I'm miserable. I don't produce good stuff. It's funny. I mean, from, from my perspective, what I'm trying to do at the moment is to give, you know, assuming I've got the morning free, to give two hours maybe three hours to the writing and then stop because and when it's not going well I'll say okay, I'll do an hour I'll do two hours because you can do nothing like or you can waste an hour and do bad writing and that's fine your life isn't wasted so I think it's sort of a you play a game with your head that um that it's you're not giving so much to it that you could waste your life but you're giving enough to feed the beast that needs to be yeah. fed, I think. Yeah, see, I'm like you. Yeah, I was a little bit sort of not not honest, speaking of emotional honesty, when I said that in one hour, and it, 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 yeah, I never write also for one hour. I mean, two, three hours, like what you described, it sounds to me wonderful. That's pretty much what I try to do as well. But you need you need dishonesty as well as honesty. So I need to trick my mind if I'm not feeling like it. I need to say, it's okay. You only need an hour. I put the timer on. Just an hour. Just write whatever rubbish you can for an hour, and then you're done. And generally, something will click, and you can do another hour, and then another hour. And I don't think that's. So I don't think honesty is always the key. I think sometimes speaking yourself is very important. Absolutely, I write a lot about this. Actually, I totally agree with you, and I write a lot about uh, quite a bit about this in the writer led bear. But one of the things that helped me writing is developing all sorts of self talks like this, where I thought of trick myself. It's a bit like also if you're afraid of writing about something, you can always we can always say to ourselves, "Well, you know, I'll just write it for myself." And later I'll completely change it. But of course, once you've written it, you become braver. I think we're all much more fearful of what we're about to write before we've written it. Before, Because writing is such a hard work. But once you sort of have it on a page, uh, then I think for me at least I become braver. But that's a different topic already. <laughs> yeah, I think um, I wouldn't say it was bravery. I would say I have a canvas. Before I write anything, I have no canvas. And what can you paint on? if it's just air and it seems to me that when you say you've got four tenants four um writing tenants and the second one is all writing is rewriting and that's what I got from that that the way I see it is the first draft is simply the canvas simply something that gives you um a weight under you from which you can start is there something of that in your tenant yeah, 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 absolutely. I completely think along those lines as well. And I remember how many books I killed just by trying to to make that first draft perfect and trying to craft it word after word. Of course, it never works like this. And you have to make a lot of mess first before you sort of start making, as you say. So I completely agree. I work along the same lines. Yes. I think about writing as layering. So then I sort of stress a bit less. And what I mean by this is that I try to in, uh, I try to think about every draft as, as another layering of, of what I've created. And I try to focus on every draft on just one or two main aspects, like one draft for characterization, one draft for uh, sense of place. And of course, I fix other things as I go. But I just feel for me personally, it works better if I layer the work as opposed to try to achieve everything every in every sort of redrafting. I'm just going to go quickly over these other three tenants um, because I think it'll be useful for people. Um, your first tenant is to write is to read. What what do you mean by that? Oh, that's so hard to say again uh, very briefly, but thank you. That's, um, yeah, I suppose to me it means that um, I, lo I, treat, I taught myself not to see reading as a luxury or indulgence. I actually see it as my 
professional development. <laughs> Those words sound so formal, but I, but I do. And so I try to read at least 50. Uh, I try to sort of spend 50-50 of my time on reading and on writing and to read deliberately, um, to read analytically, to think about what kind of books I'm choosing, what is going to feed my project, not just necessarily in terms of research. I mean, research is, of course, that's very important, but that's kind of obvious. But beyond the research, I, when I write, I also try always to read books that will nourish me enough so I can... So my output would be better. So I always try to read things above what I write. I I try not to read books where I go, oh, I could do this too, because that's not going to nourish me. And I try to read books that will depress me because they'll be so good where I go, I can never do this. But I think when you read books like this, they hopefully something sort of trickle into you. That That's what I mean by um, to write is to read. So I see it really as a symbiotic sort of relationship. So you can't just say I'm a good reader and I'm going to write. I think at least for me, but I think for a lot of writers, other writers too, they have to work together. I'll just quickly say that I'm really interested in the process of um, uh, and Salman Rushdie. I almost forgot his name suddenly because he's a prose writer and he's a wonderful prose writer. I really love his work. But when he writes his novels, he mostly reads poetry because he wants to nourish his prose, he wants to cultivate his prose. So I often think about him when I think about to write is to read how these this things are sort of not, not as easily separated. It's funny, Lee, whenever I speak to you, I always feel soothed by at least one thing you've said. And, and today it's that to, to teach yourself that reading is not an indulgence. Um, and I think I did that when I was judging. So the good thing about judging is that you're getting paid, not much, but you're getting paid. <laughs> and um, and so, you know, that was probably the only time where during the day I could sit back in a chair and read um, as though I was writing a submission, as though I was oh, I was managing a hearing. Uh, and there's something um, there's something quite empowering about that, isn't there? Yeah, I very much agree. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it really is. We sort of taught, we, I mean, you know, we maybe come from different backgrounds, but I think we have the same sort of work ethic. You have to be productive. You <laughs> have to be productive when you're writing. You <laughs> That's, but it's a self-talk I developed once again. It's sort of reminding yourself constantly. It's, it doesn't come to me naturally either. I, I understand you completely. <laughs> I'm reading at the moment um, this book by Bridget Delaney. I think you might know as well, um, yeah. uh, Reasons Not to Worry, and it's about the Stoics. And, yeah. um, and and I think that probably feeds into this as well in terms of how do you find a philosophy that allows you to find meaning in who you are, um, which which I think is what your, your book does. You... Um, you ask us or you suggest that we write what is urgent. What does that mean? Mm. Um, it means that uh, for me uh, that um, I, or not. when I say for me, I'm being, again, dishonest. <laughs> I mentor writers and I teach writers and I'm friends with writers. So I've, I've, from what everything I see around, not just my experience, those books that people write just because they're curious about mildly or... Um, they usually often think they will, will sell. They're often not the best books. They sometimes get published, but they're not necessarily going to be really great books. I think really good books come from internal urgency. It doesn't have to be about us. It can be a book about robots or dragons or set in medieval Japan. But, um, but they need to be books where the writer feels they need to understand something for themselves and it's urgent for them to understand. And the key word for me is to understand as opposed to um, tell the word, to convey message. That Those books, again, they're not, they don't usually, you just you just know when you, I don't know, you just know somehow when you read the book if it was really important to the writer um, and if it was a kind of explorer's book as opposed to lecturer's book. It just, it, it just, it's, it's, it's kind of energy. I don't know. It's like people say, well, how do you know when you're in love? You feel it. You can't really explain it. I think it's the same with books. And there was somebody, I can't remember who it was, but who said this, uh, um, a famous writer, but, um, if what doesn't, if the book it, uh, doesn't keep the author 
um, awake at night, you won't keep awake the readers either when they, they, they read something along those lines. We were talking before we came on air about um, Carol Major's book, The Asparagus Wars. Now, when you were telling me about write what's urgent, I mean, that for me is an example of an urgent, grief-stricken, bittersweet, love-filled, beautifully written book about her her daughter who was um, who had muscular dystrophy. Um, is that an urgent book from... Oh. Goodness, yeah, I think we, we're in complete agreement you now on this book, yes, I just love it. It's a bit like, uh, it, it's incredible how how urgent feels for the author to write it, but also how then the voice is, 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 is a measured voice, it's a voice of distance, and it, it's a beautiful balance to achieve, to write about something you deeply deeply feel about, but to write it with this distance, with, a bit, with some lightness, even though it's a very dark topic, the way Carol manages um in then hindsight and and wit and and um uh compassion it just yeah it's just a wonderful book in so many ways very rich very small but so much wisdom packed there so much humanity after you write what's urgent you want us to write what makes us blush <laughs> <laughs> well that's because um as probably everybody else knows and i'm probably stating the obvious but good readers of literature they don't go to to books to sort of for polite conversations they go to talk about things we don't normally talk about you know at the dinner party uh we read books because we want to understand something hidden about humanity all those neuroses and deep desires and uncomfortable things so it actually was not me but um um Karl of Knosgaard which is one of my favorite living authors he's from Norway uh who said that he uses something as a writer what he calls shame omitter so like barometer um uh so whenever he feels a feeling of shame it signifies he says it signifies for him relevance as in it needs to be in his work and I, I think it's a great idea to use your sense of shame, your discomfort. It doesn't have to be shame, it can be just discomfort or embarrassment as you as as a tool to know what to write about. I would make though a big distinction between shame and discomfort and trauma, like really deep pain. That's why I talk about writing what makes you blush and not what makes you ache. Because I think writing about something really traumatic, not only it's really distressing and disturbing to the writer, but from artistic point of view, when it really hurts, we are unlikely to have enough distance to also to make an artwork from that. But discomfort, feeling embarrassed, not wanting to the, the world to know your flaws, that's what we have to go for, I reckon, to write a good book. <laughs> and um, and again, I'll use the asparagus wars for that, because in that, I mean, Carol Major uh, bears her soul and her flaws and the embarrassing things and the humiliating things. It's um, it's an act of bravery. I've noticed the time and I'm just going to open it up to everybody. If you had a question, um, could you please pop it in the chat uh, section? Um, Barbie has said, um, has got a comment, which is um, reading is productive. You can't be a writer if you don't read. Um, I wish I had um, I wish all my students understood this. <laughs> really, they don't. Not 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 many, not that many. I mean, the older ones, yes, but the younger ones, <laughs> not always. Is, is, is that a phone thing? Do you think? I think it's a more thing that we live at the moment in the golden age of TV series. The TV series are so amazing. But I just get a lot of writers who tell me, no, when I say writers, not published writers, aspiring writers in my classes who tell me how much they learn about narrative from Netflix. And, you know, and and, and look, I, I learned about narrative on Netflix too, but it's just not enough on its own, you know. Um, yeah, look, um, Barbie, Barbie um, has agreed that, that, that this um, this reading issue, she thinks too, is about age. 
Um, I wanted to get some recommendations from you. Three books. What three okay. books? Okay, so I've got them here. Excitedly. There's nothing I like more than recommending books. Seriously, I do. I really do. Um, so this is a book by Iranian Australian. Have you read, read it? Um uh, No, I I've watched its um I've watched its soaring to heights. Oh. I think in, in, in the Stella Prize and then I think in the international translation. Okay. It was shortlisted for the booker. Oh, that's right. And it's a publisher, beautiful publisher, Wildingo Press. I so um, applaud them for, for publishing this book. Uh, so it's an Iranian-Australian writer who is an exophonic writer like myself, meaning she writes in a language which is not her mother tongue. She came to Australia only in 2011. Um, so it's called The Enlightenment of Greenwich Tree, and it's about... Uh, it's really about what happened to Iran after the Islamic Revolution. Uh, it's a deeply sad and disturbing book, but it's also deeply playful and witty and um, rich in folklore. It, it, it's written like, it reminds me so much, A Hundred Years of Solitude by Marquez. So she uses um, magical realism to lighten a story, which is really a tragedy, you know. Uh, the things that happen to the characters they are bad because she employs magical realism the tragedy is bearable and you get through the book feeling devastated but also hopeful uh, it, it's a really incred it's an incredible book really is and um, it's deeply erudite it's steeped in um, there's so many literary references there i'm sure there are many i missed too but yeah it's just makes you fall in love with literature all over again this is um a book by amos oz it's called amos oz is probably the best known internationally israeli writer and he's also was was because he is he died a few years ago uh he was also a very notable peace activist and this is his memoir which is kind of Fiction, a bit, so it, it, it's, it sort of sits somewhere between memoir and fiction. And I love it, but it doesn't commit to any of the genres. It's called A Tale of Love and Darkness. And it's a story of his life in the shadow of his mother's suicide. So his mother um, has committed suicide when he was only 12 years old. Um, and so the, and, and, um, the book really sort of traces what led to this and then how it has shaped his life and it said a lot, big part of this book set in his childhood which is um in uh jerusalem and it's um yeah it's a really rich again like like shukufi Azaz, there's some similarities between these books that's why i picked them up they're both deeply personal they're both political they're both extraordinary rich in themes i mean the amos was also really rich storyteller and it's not magical realism it's memoir but he tells you so many um stories from before he was born and it, it just yeah amazing amazing how wide-ranging the storytelling there and the last book that i chose by um turkish american writer elif batuman have you heard of her or read her season no, I have I have read another Elif who's Turkish, but I have not read that one. <laughs> yeah, I know which one you mean, and I everybody mentions her, and I would love to read her too. But this one, oh my God, she is amazing. So her book is called The Possessed, and it's a memoir as well. And the subtitle of this book is Adventures with Russian Books and the People Who Read Them. Now, the premise of this book is that she so will sound extraordinarily tedious. So Elif Betuman talks about her younger years when she was a student of literature at university and studied Russian classics. I mean, how exciting. <laughs> Not. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing book. It's a page turner. She just made it's it's basically a totally rollicking, dark comedy of academic life and of a school and, a, and of, a, of a book lover's life. And I mean, you know, Russian literature has a very justifiably this very reputation, this very heavy, very serious sort of literature. It's so funny, this book. And you don't even need to know the Russian classics to enjoy it. It's just like reading pure comedy, but with a lot of intellect in it thrown in very wow. much. What, what a selection. Go you. <laughs> um, Sharaf. Elif Sharaf. 
yes 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 that's that that's on my list yes she's definitely on my list yes um not the possessed so that, that, that that'll be on my list and in the newsletter next week um just to, just a comment um from Dina Davis who's an author and she gives you <laughs> uh, thanks for your inspiring messages to us writers Lee love that reading is work too <laughs> so um I'm going to call it quits now so everybody can go back to their evening. Uh, thank you so much for your time, uh, your big brain, Lee, your thoughtful uh, answers to questions. It's um, it's always a delight speaking to you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Susan. Yeah, the same here. <laughs> Lovely <laughs> having you talking to you. <laughs> yeah, until next time. See you. Bye, everybody. Thanks for coming. See you next week.